All right, so again, my name is Mariusz Nowostawski. I will be your host for the first part of the uh, introduction to Go programming, which is a, a prerequisite for the cloud course. Uh, we will cover Go fundamentals in the first uh, three sessions, so today and next week. And then Christopher and the teaching staff will continue educating you on Golang in the context of cloud computing. So you will have more cloud related topics and more uh, programming tasks oriented towards cloud. Uh, we will diverge. So the uh, more programming oriented content will continue in the PROC 206 and then cloud oriented content will carry, carry on in uh, PROC 205. So apologies for potentially a little bit of a, um, yeah, um, complicated setup. So we have a uh, PROC 205 um, repo and the course. Uh, and even though the videos will be uh, in the YouTube channel for the 206, the code examples and everything that I will be doing will be here uh, and for everybody to, uh, to see because uh, that course is not, um, this, this course is visible to, to everybody basically. Um, so, a couple of logistic issues. Um, you should all request access to this project, to uh, PROC 205 2022. Uh, and if you did so, uh, you will be given a workspace uh, in GitLab for your own uh, projects and your assignments and, and things like that. And that one is available um, under, if you go to the PROC 205 2022 workspace. Uh, most of you already did that. They've already requested access to the other one. And then the projects, the, the groups are here and the URL is basically um, um, course PROC 205, uh, PROC 205 2022 workspace slash your username. You will not see that. I see that because I'm an admin, uh, but you will not see everybody's um, uh, I hope you will not see that. Uh, and then to access your workspace, for example, for Krisa2511, you basically have to say slash Krisa2, uh, what was it, 2511. Uh, so you basically use your uh, GitLab username to get access to your workspace. And you're given an um, a ownership of that workspace, of that group. And you can create uh, projects as much as you want. And you can create some dummy projects. You can play with it. You can delete the projects. So you basically have kind of an ownership of a subset of GitLab, and which is entirely to you. Uh, and you can use it for doing assignments and um, uh, working on projects. So those of you who hasn't has not done that yet, please do this. And then you will. Uh, be uh, accessible, it will be accessible under the PROC 205 2022 workspace for you. The course material is in PROC 205 2022, and there is a repo. Uh, so the repo is currently uh, not populated with anything. So what I will do is I will clone the repo. Um, so copy the URL. So I will do uh, git clone and I will clone the repo into my own workspace. Uh, and from now on, uh, we haven't, I don't think Christopher told you, but for all the uh, PROC 206 and PROC 205 classes and lectures, it is good to take your laptop with you and be able to, uh, obviously watching this in a laptop, but if, if we will have the physical sessions up, uh, uh, do the uh, bring your laptops as well, and you may be uh, able to do some practical uh, things while we doing the the lecture. Um, so as you see, the the repo has uh, a single readme file. So if I go to the cloned repo, um, five twenty twenty two, uh, I have this single readme file in in the in the folder. Um, Christopher asked me not to use uh, Vim too much, uh, but uh, you can use an editor of your choice. So for example, if I uh, use VS Code, I will see that I have no um, Golang files in that folder. Um, 
yeah, I trust. And then you can use uh, VS Code or IntelliJ uh, and so on. We will talk a little bit about the, the choice of IDE in a minute. Um, the point is that to understand what is actually happening, uh, it's, it's good to interact with the command line because then you're in charge of exactly what is happening. And then uh, sometimes if you're using IDE, the IDE is doing things in the background. And if you know and understand what is happening in the background, that's fine. But as you're learning, sometimes it's a little bit black magic. Like you don't know exactly what's happening. And as long as everything works fine, everything is fine. But as soon as something in the IDE is not working, then you need to debug like what is, what is wrong. And then being able to go to your command line and check if your code is the problem or if the setup of the ID is the problem, uh, you can distinguish. So you can come back to the code, uh, to, to the command line, check, compile it manually. And then if everything is fine, you know the problem is not with your code, the problem is with the setup of your IDE. Uh, if something is broken here, then maybe the IDE setup is okay. Maybe you need to fix your, your coding problems first. Um, all right, so we will come back to that as well. Uh, we will um, use a mentee today. So please join um, Please join the Mentimeter. And you can ask me questions in the, uh, in the mentee itself, or uh, you can ask questions or interact through the, um, through the chat uh, in Zoom. So I will uh, try to follow the questions in, um, in chat uh, and also try to follow the, if there are any questions in the Mentimeter. Excellent. So let's do a little bit of an introduction. Um, so who am I? I'm a lecturer, I'm a researcher and programmer. Christopher told you a little bit about me yesterday. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, decentralization and decentralization technologies. I was originally coming from um, artificial life and artificial um, uh, modeling of living processes, which are naturally fully decentralized. Uh, so modeling how the cells operate and how the evolution happens. Uh, and that kind of led me to being focused on decentralization. And as you know, the recent kind of hype around decentralization has been centered around blockchain technology and some of the uh, decentralized finance and decentralized identity management. So there is quite a lot of interesting things which are happening uh, recently around those topics. So I'm, I'm mostly working on, on, on those, but I'm also very passionate about programming, programming languages and um, ability for us to express sort of uh, behaviors and complex systems using software. Um, so for fun, I have some quizzes, uh, not, not much today, uh, but you know you can score some points and we can test how the Mentimeter uh, works. So the first, first question is, I will let you guys join. Uh, a couple of more, we have 75 in the session. So I will wait a little bit more for you guys to join so you can uh, interact. Yeah, let's get to 60. Come on. Two more. Excellent, great. Thank you very much. So the first kind of a fun question is, um, what I and Christopher like to do in New Zealand? Uh, so we used to work together in New Zealand and now we're working together in Norway. Uh, what we like to do, to do together, but we don't do it in, in Norway anymore. We could, but we don't. All right, let's see how it's going. Surfing, yes, I did some surfing, uh, but uh, uh, Christopher was not surfing. Uh, we did some running actually together, uh, not paragliding. Uh, not skiing, ah, a lot of good ideas. Yeah, we should have done all of that. Uh, we did a lot of scuba diving together. We were part of the uh, university scuba diving course uh, club and we were uh, doing 
quite a lot that we were living on the coast and it was great. All right, so, um, so what I like to do uh, beside programming and teaching the most. Yeah, some of you know me already and you will guess. And I think I, I ran that quiz uh, in your first year uh, and, and uh, the BPROC students at least. All right, so paragliding, excellent. And some people scored correctly. Um, yes, I also love climbing. I also love running and cycling, but the, the, light, the love of my life is uh, paragliding. So I, that's a photo in Nepal. Um, I was paragliding two years ago uh, and I do paragliding in Norway as well. It's a great country for it. Uh, I encourage you to pick that up. Uh, all right, so you know a little bit more now about me. Um, and how about you? So tell me a little bit about yourself. So what would characterize you as, uh, as students, but also as people? What do you like doing? Yeah, some gamers, some skiers, people like music, metal. Of course, some of you like programming, that's why you're here. Runners, making music. What sort of instruments do you play? Jazz. Christopher is really into music. Water kayaking. Yeah, I never tried that. I was keen, but never really had the opportunity yeah procrastinating of course we are masters in that chess good anyone playing go like the the go the game of go i love that game it's so hard <laughs> climbers yeah great so maybe we meet in the fjellhallen Good. All right. So I get a feel and you get a feel of who we, uh, we're we dealing here with. Uh, gaming is quite uh, popular. Um, Girls up is popular. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. All right. Um, so in terms of programming, um, some of you will have some experience in programming. Some will have less. Um, so can you um just indicate where you're coming from i know from uh, from last session that we have sort of a split of 30 30 30 roughly speaking about the cohorts um so some of you will come from c c plus plus background some of you will come from uh, java and python um i forgot to add um i forgot to add uh, a question about not being comfortable with programming at all uh, but I guess uh, we can see that from the numbers. So as I said, we have about 70, 70 people total. So um, most of you will likely to be comfortable in programming in some language. Uh, and that is a good jumping start into Golang. Uh, if you you know comfortable programming in anything, then learning Golang will be easy. It will be very straightforward. Um, okay, so that is quite a good distribution, I guess. Uh, although I don't remember if I allowed multiple answers, but um, yeah, it's it's a good coverage. Um, Haskell is not popular. Uh, some of you will know Haskell at the end of this semester. Um, yeah, sounds good. Okay, so let's go into Go. Um, Go has been um, designed by uh, Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, and uh, Robert Grissemel uh, in, in, um, in Google. So they all work in, in, at, at Google and they 
decided that Google needs a very robust server side programming language, okay, which will be easy to uh, onboard new people and it will be really fast at compiling large projects, right? What does it mean server side? What do you think is a server side programming language? What other sort of a programming languages of, of flavors do you know that are not server side? Um, how about, you know, JavaScript? Yes, so that's what, what's that? Is it a server side programming language or is it more like a front end programming language? Yeah, it's more front end, more client side. Um, what else often we say? We, we sometimes say system level programming or application level programming, right? We distinguish programming languages which are more oriented toward programming systems and kind of uh, not necessarily operating systems, but, but large systems uh, and applications, right? We distinguish that. Um, so client side and application, they have slightly different features and then server side, has slightly different features. So what do you think server-side programming mean? Like what features the language should have to be a good server-side programming language? So for client-side, uh, of course, we think about some form of UI, right? If, if we're thinking about applications and, and, and client-side, we think the language should have facilities to express user interface somehow easily and nicely. Uh, right, that's the kind of the prerequisite uh, for server side. Yes, very good point from Oscar, like um, concurrency and, and, and parallelism, right? So servers typically have to work with heavy loads and you have to be able to do multiple things at the same time. So a good support for concurrency is sort of a prerequisite for a server side programming language. Uh, so that's, I think, I have as a last point. So it is, you know, Go has kind of concurrency built in. Concurrency is very easy uh, in, 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 in Golang um, and it's, it's well supported. And the other, you know, server side programming language uh, feature that often is required is a very good networking support, right? So we envision that servers have to communicate over networks with clients and, and so on. So on. So, Concurrency and networking are sort of the two uh, important um, important aspects. All right, so um, a little bit of a history. Um, Go has uh, started in 2009, but it's not, you know, it doesn't, it, it hasn't started out of the blue. It's just a kind of a descendant of uh, a, a long line of programming languages. And as you can see, uh, Pike kind of appears in uh, two prerequisites, uh, predecessors of, of Golang, uh, in Squeak and New Squeak. Um, I did, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I did quite, um, I, I did enjoy programming in, in Squeak and New Squeak. Uh, they had kind of a interesting uh, language features, which were quite unique. And as, as you can see, they are kind of a different line compared to the, to the C line or to the kind of an algal main, main algal line. Um, so Pike had kind of a history of developing programming languages and then they get together with Thomson and uh, a Google engineer to do Golang. And they benefited from all those kind of, uh, some of the features of those uh, programming languages. So a question to you, uh, one of the Go designers in Ken, is Ken Thomson, uh, so, some of you have participated in the quiz in the first year, and you will know the answer to this one. Um, but uh, some of you may need to guess. So which programming language can Thomson invent it? It's a good, uh, I, I kind of like this question because a lot of people get confused with uh, the designers of C. <laughs> So Ken Thompson was the precursor of C. He was the guy who invented B, which was a direct precursor of C. And he was the guy who was using C to do Unix, uh, but he was not the designer of C. It was uh, Richie and um, Carnegie, which were the designers of C, right? So the correct answer is B. So uh, Ken Thompson was a good friend of, uh, 
of Richie and they were kind of working together on B, although B was the, uh, the, the child of Ken Thompson. Um, and then C happened uh, and it kind of changed the way we programmed. So ob obviously C was much better than B because uh, you may not even heard of B uh, before, uh, but everybody heard of C. All right, so we have some, um, some good fight. Uh, we didn't have too much of a quiz this time around, but uh, congratulations to Rock On. Well done. Okay, so the motivation for, um, for Google to come up with the, this new language was, um, as we were discussing, kind of a rich standard library, which will allow programming servers really easily without external dependencies. That was kind of a design decision. Uh, the other requirement they had was they deal with really large software systems. They have you know, millions of lines of code. And as you know, productivity of the developers is kind of uh, related to the cycle of you doing things, compiling and testing, and then doing things, compiling and testing. And then if the compile time takes long time, uh, the cycle is kind of uh, long and then you, your productivity drop uh, drops. So the design was that even if you're dealing with a multi-module, multi-sub-project uh, projects, uh, rebuilding it will be fast. And you may not experience it in this course, but if you, for example, take um, some of the blockchain uh, systems, which are relatively complex, uh, some of them are written in Go, and then rebuilding it is a matter of uh, you know, um, sub-minute. And then if you take some which are written in Rust, for example, then you just start and you go for a coffee, right? Uh, it's, it's minutes or, or some, in some cases, like really, really long time. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, so fast compile time was kind of um, uh, one of the important aspects. And then they wanted the language to be, uh, to, to have a modern feel. Uh, so the integrated tool chain and everything that you do with the language um, is built in such that you don't need to fiddle with the additional infrastructure. Uh, so we will come back to that in a moment. So the, the, the main core features uh, of Go, uh, it is a compiled language. So when you write your source code, then you will compile it into a native executable. Um, Golang is statically typed. Um, that means every variable and everything, every construct in the language has a well-defined type. Um, you don't have to uh, declare all the types, but the runtime system and the compiler will uh, infer the, uh, the types. So for example, if I, uh, if I declare a variable A and I assign it a, a value one, uh, I didn't told the compiler what type A is, but uh, the compiler will default to using um, an int 32 uh, as the type of A, right? Uh, I will not be able to reassign an, a different type uh, to A after this initialization, right? So after I've initialized A, a is of type uh, int32, uh, and it will never change. Uh, it, the, the A type uh, kind of stays for the entire duration of the, of the life of A in, in a scope, uh, which is different to Python, for example, where A will have kind of a numerical type. If I do this, A will have a numerical type, but later on I can assign string to it, uh, and it will have a string type, right? Um, so in, in Go, all the variables are statically typed. Um, and it is kind of an imperative structured uh, language based on functions. So nothing new here. It's so, sort of the same as you know, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, all the other programming languages, Python. Uh, it, they're all imperative structured and based on functions. Um, it is, I, I said based on functions because it's a little bit differently based on functions that for example, C++. Uh, it can, it, it is designed to be easily expressing functional relationships and functions in the scope of other functions and passing functions as a kind of a first 
type first um, class citizens, right? So for example, if you were to write a function which returns a function in C or C++, you can do that, but it's a little bit complicated. And then if you want to have a generator which returns a function, which returns a function, you almost kill yourself, right? Because it gets so complicated that you don't want to be dealing with that anymore. In Go, it is still a, you know, a bit complicated, but it's not complicated enough to you not to be doing that. And doing this kind of type of chaining and using some sort of meta programming based on functional relationships is very possible in Go, uh, which is also possible like in Java or C++, but it's much harder. Uh, it is relatively easy to do that in Python, for example. Python is also quite nice because you can chain those functions and you can return functions and you can pass functions as parameters and, and so on. So Golang is sort of uh, similar, even though Golang is um, statically typed. Um, it has a managed memory. So unlike C or C++, we have a garbage collector and the runtime system takes care of your dangling pointers and all your memory leaks and things like that, right? So it will be safe, uh, same as, uh, you know, Java or Python, uh, but it will have this um, uh, side effect that sometimes your program will kick in the garbage collector and may slow down a little bit, right? So for some real-time applications, that may not be uh, the best. Like for real-time applications or embedded applications, we often use uh, languages that don't have uh, managed memory, like C, C++, or Rust. Um, and as we said, it has a concurrency built-in. So you have uh, two basic constructs, coroutines and channels, and they cover quite a wide spectrum of uh, different use cases. And they, that makes the language kind of easy uh, to deal with concurrency. Uh, we will have a concurrency lecture next week where I will introduce the coroutines and channels, and I will show you how easy it is to kind of build an application which does multiple things at the same time. Um, and it doesn't have inheritance. I talked a little bit about it in the PROC 2006 for the BPROC students, uh, that there is kind of the perception that object-oriented programming is good for some of the applications and so on, but it was, it, it is, it turned out not to be as great as we originally thought in 60s, right? So when object-oriented programming happened, you know, was invented, uh, people were believing that object-oriented programming is the panacea for everything and everything will be forever object-oriented. And experience tells us that that's not entirely true, that large complex systems, which are based on uh, high, uh, deep uh, high inheritance hierarchies, are actually very complicated to maintain. They are complicated to design. They are quite rigid. They are not easy to change. Uh, and they are not that great. So the designers of Golang decided to actually have no inheritance whatsoever. You, you, you cannot uh, do kind of inheritance of types. Uh, and you would say, whoa, that's such a big limitation, right? How can I uh, abstract certain behaviors and then specialize it later? Well, you do that through delegation, decomposition, uh, and through interfaces. So again, I will uh, later on, I, I think you will kind of get the idea of why you don't need inheritance, but you can express exactly the same things as you can express in uh, C++ using um, delegation and composition instead. Um, all right. So um, any questions so far? No questions? Great. So as I said, um, the language feels quite modern. Uh, even though it is very small and even though you can learn it relatively quickly, it has a very modern feel. And this is because of some elements. So the first one is it has quite a rich and large ecosystem. So Google decided um, to put a lot of resources in, in, in building the, uh, the standard libraries and the ecosystem. And it has a, you know, a good and comprehensive abstractions, which allow you to do uh, to be quite effective in doing server-side programming. So for example, if you were given a task of creating a simple REST API server uh, in C, uh, it would be quite complicated for you to deal with JSON, 
to deal with the endpoints, to deal with the concurrency of the, of the server connectivity, to deal with networking and so on. Whereas in Go, it's you know, relatively simple. And in a short number of lines of code, you can have a very simple REST API server. Um, you will see that, you will see why we chose Go for the cloud course because of those features. Um, so not like you have to trust us that it's a good choice, uh, but later on you will see that it is indeed a good choice. Um, most of the better projects uh, since we introduced Golang a couple of years ago, actually choose Golang as a server side programming language. So when the students need some form of backend and they need some sort of a front end to communicate to, to the backend, they do choose Golang because it is relatively easy and quite robust in providing the functionality they need. Um, so there is a question of why it compiles faster than other languages. Uh, it is a little bit complicated to go deep into the reasons, but the because the design of the language had this as a um, as an objective. So by design, the the Golang engineers uh, were paying attention of how to organize the internal representations of the language and the, the compile in, uh, intermediate language in such a way that they can do um, a lot of compile time optimizations for the. Um, yeah, for this intermediate representation. And that achieves this um, uh, speed up in the compile time. Um, yeah, so there is a, thank you, Marcus. There is a hint to, to read a little bit more details of why it is so fast. Great, thanks. We can, uh, I will use this as a pointer later um, in the wiki. So, and it, the Golang also has an excellent uh, tooling support. So for example, um, managing modules, uh, verifying your code, uh, doing the code code formatting, uh, testing framework, profiling framework, uh, documentation framework, all of those are part of the standard library. All of those are part of the st standard toolkit uh, and tool chain. And you don't need anything like it, the language comes with all the batteries included right so it's it's relatively straightforward to do most of the uh tooling related aspects in golang just in, by installing golang you don't need anything extra right so um before we continue uh i have been talking for so long so let's let me um maybe uh do a little bit of a demo to for everybody to get a feel um so if we were to start obviously we have to start with hello world right uh so let's um let's write a very simple hello world program so i'm currently in the top level folder of this um of this uh repository no this one so here uh, in the main branch. Um, by the way, uh, in the in the chat, Zoom chat, could you please uh, indicate using a number uh, from zero to ten how comfortable you are using Git? So it, you know, th this is not tracked. Uh, I I just. And the teaching staff probably wants to know roughly. There was one zero. Most of it is over five. There is one two. Um, so the programming students, uh, they have been using um, uh, Git quite extensively, but I'm not sure about the, the uh, other cohorts. So if, if there is um, a, uh, a desire to have a bit of a session on Git, uh, please indicate it to the tutors and to the teaching staff such that we provide you some extra help uh, with Git because this course uh, will use Git um, and you will um, have to do submissions and all, all your assignments using uh, uh, Git, of course. Okay, so um, to do hello world, I need some kind of folder to, to put my code into. So let's uh, make uh, make folder called hello. Um, Oh, hello world. And then I will go in. And now um, 
you would typically use an IDE to uh, to write the code, but because, as I said, I want to kind of exp exp explain to you how everything works behind the scene, I will basically create a, a file myself and I will edit that file. Um, and the um, in Golang, um, everything lives in some form of a package. Everything needs to be in some form of a package. So like in Python, things can live in like a void. Uh, in C or C++, again, you don't need to have a namespace, namespaces. Uh, but in Golang, you know, everything needs to be in a package. And the packages um, don't really follow the strict uh, folder hierarchy like in um, in Java, but there is a, there are certain rules of how the packages are managed and how we uh, use them. So I will talk a little bit more about it uh, a bit later, but for now, you just need to trust me that I have to say package, and then the entry point into the application is always in the package main. So um, you can have a function main in a different uh, package than main, but that function main will be treated like any other function. If, if the function main must be treated specially as an entry point to the application, it has to be in the package main. Uh, and then functions are written using func, then the function name, then the parameter list, then the output type of the function. If it's, if it's void in, in a sense like it returns nothing, then we write nothing, and then the open bracket. And then we use the curly braces, the same as in C or C++, right? So the functions are defined by the func keyword, uh, followed by the name, followed by the parameters. Uh, the parameters to the function, so if I were to, to write a function which um, adds two numbers, so let's have a function which adds two numbers and returns a number, I would have to say there are two numbers, and then I say what type those numbers are. So let's say those are of type int 32. And then I say, what is the return type of the function? And then the body of the function, right? So then I can say return a plus b. As you notice, um, there is no semicolon um, similar to Python. Uh, the designers of the language said, you know, what is the hell with all those semicolons? Uh, so if you have a single line, which is clear to the compiler what you want, you don't need the semicolon. Sometimes you want to do multiple things in a single line, and then, then you will need to separate it by semicolon, but normally you, you, don't, you, you don't do that. In fact, if you do a semicolon, uh, sometimes the, um, uh, the linter or the compiler will complain saying, yeah, you, you don't need a semicolon here. Uh, so then for printing hello world, uh, we need to have some sort of a print facility, right? Um, so I will hint you that we need kind of a library for doing all the input output. And that library is called FMT, like format. Uh, so then what we will do is we will require uh, FMT and that, um, oh, sorry, not require, it's called import. Um, so we will import a, a package, uh, which is called FMT. It's part of the standard library. Uh, which contains functions for um, some simple console-based I/O operations. Um, so then you will say FMT, and then you will say print line. Uh, why I know this? Why I know the FMT is a part of the standard library? Well, you basically need to Google that, but you don't go to um, you don't go to Stack Overflow, uh, or you don't go to um, some search engine, you basically go to, to docs or to packages, uh, and then you will kind of try to find what is the package that you're looking for. So for example, we want to print something, right? So if I just search for print, uh, I will see that uh, there is, uh, yeah, so the, all those are kind of external uh, packages which have to do with some form of printing, but they are not part of the standard library, right? So to get to the uh, standard library, I will have to go to uh, go modules reference. And here I will have, um, no, this is a reference to the modules. Uh, just give me a second. 
package documentation, that one. And then I will have all the packages which are part of the building standard libraries. And you will notice that there is one called FMT here, and it says uh, FMT package implements formatted IO with functions analogous to C, print and scan, right? Because we want to print hello world, that's the package that we probably need. And then if you go there, you will see uh, you will see all the functions which are there. And one of the functions is called print line and print. And those are the ones that we need, right? So if I check what print line does, it says print line formats using the default formats, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, if I say, uh, hello world, that will do what I need, right? Um, so this is your friend, the, the, um, the um, help which is here will explain to you what is available and often it shows you uh, often it shows you some code snippets of how um, things work. So for example, if I go to print line, it has an example and it basically says, okay, you're importing FMT, it shows again like a main function that's exactly what i'm doing here and it shows you okay you basically do this right so you can mix uh variables uh with text and everything is kind of uh comma separated and it will kind of substitute the variables with the content and kind of uh, print the whole thing uh using a space as a delimiter between the things that you kind of separated by the comma right uh, so if I try to replicate this, I will say I have some variable name, which is Marius. And if I say, uh, hello, uh, name, that presumably will say hello space Marius, right? Uh, following this example. Uh, and those are great because, um, if you check something here and it tells you that you're using something this particular way, this is like an orthodox way of doing it. If you find a particular example in Stack Overflow, you will never be sure if that's the orthodox way of doing something like this, or if it's somebody's thinking of doing something this particular way, but it's wrong, right? So you actually have to follow the comments. You have to read the discussion. You have to, sometimes, you know, when you Google something on Stack Overflow, you have an answer. And then you read, 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 read. And then like one of the not super upvoted answer is like the upper one is wrong because you should be doing it this way, right? And then that's the correct answer. And then finding that it's kind of tricky. So if you use this, if you use the, um, the standard library um, help, uh, they will tell you exactly what is the orthodox way of, of using things. And that's the best way of finding, for example, how you would use a web server or how would you define like, a, um, so let's say I want to um, find in, um, we have a net package and in net package, we have an HTTP uh, examples. And then they tell you exactly how you're supposed to use the built-in HTTP server. And this is the best resource to learn how to use HTTP uh, uh, building server and connectivity uh, instead of doing tutorials or doing some sort of stack overflow. Uh, yes, I'm ranting a little bit, but it is important that you use this as a resource. I, I use it and I learn uh, kind of the orthodox way of, of, of solving certain things uh, through following the docs. Okay, so before the break, uh, um, so there is a question from Ole. I will come back to that after the, the break. Uh, I, will, um, I will finish this by saying that the H equals at uh, one and two. And we will save this. Uh, it complains about the I, yeah, let's see, let's build it. So then like, so now I have a single, um, I have a single file in my folder 
uh, and this is an important step. You have to do Go mode in it. Um, we in this course are using uh, modules. Uh, modules have been sort of uh, competing with packages, which was the original design of uh, structuring the Golang programs, but they were sort of phased out. Uh, you can still use the, the old fashioned uh, dependency tracking, but modules are the way to go. And we decided with Christopher that we will only accept kind of our module based projects. Uh, because it's simpler, it's easier, and it's sort of de facto standard now. Unfortunately, the designers of, of, of Golang made a mistake uh, initially, and the packaging system was sort of uh, heavily based on GitHub uh, or, or some Git repositories, and it was heavily based on networking, such that managing kind of a local dependencies and local projects was a little bit kind of cumbersome. Uh, and then there was a proposal for uh, improving it and making it more modular, and it's called modules. And the modules are much more robust and much better model. Uh, so what you need is you need to say go mod in it, and that will initialize a simple file. I mean, you, you don't need to actually call it like this because you will see that the file is extremely simple. So if I do this, uh, you will see that uh, Go created um, a new file called Go mod, right? And the uh, Go mod is, it basically has two lines. It says, which version of Go are you using? And what is the module name? And in, I, in my case, because I initialized it with the hello world, it called it hello world, right? So now my project is based on a single module, which has kind of a, a hello world name. And I, I said, I want the Go dependency to be at least 1.17. Um, so now if it also, uh, it also suggested that I run Go mod tidy, which kind of refreshes the dependencies of my project. So you can always call God mode tidy to check if everything is wired up correctly. Uh, what it does, it checks all your required imports and it checks what you have in the uh, required field here. Um, and then it, it wires it up. We will come back to that a little bit later. Um, so if I say go build, um, Yes, so it complained about age. So I will go now to, to code. Um, so as you see, the compiler is a little bit picky and modern programming languages, they are always picky uh, because I declared the variable age here and I don't use it, right? Uh, so it says, okay, so why you need this line? If you don't use age, why you have this line here? Uh, so I need to use it for a uh, compiler to be happy, right? So I would say, hello, name is your age, age. Okay, so we will do this instead. So now I do build again. And now because I said go build, uh, what will happen is Golang runtime system will pick this module name, which is called hello world and it will generate an executable, which is called hello world. And this executable is a, a native executable uh, with all the static libraries built in, and I can run it, right? So I can say hello world, and it will run as expected with the colon uh, being sort of replaced by space, like so it says hello, space, Marius, space, is your age, space, three, space, right? Um, you see that? Okay, I can do the same here. So if I go in my, uh, you know, Visual Studio code and go run and say run without debugging, it will basically internally do the same thing, generate an executable run the executable, attach the debugging process into that executable to get the output which that executable produces, catch that output, print it here, and then close itself up, everything up because we quit the program, okay? Uh, should we use the specific Go version? Yes, you should use uh, 17. So the current um, top stable version is 17.6. I recommend you uh, 
I recommend you all using that version. So uh, download and install Go Golang 176. There is another question where are we supposed to clone the repo. It's up to you. So you usually clone the repo into your some kind of a folder. I have, you know, in my home folder, I have a, a folder called projects. Then I have the, so I show you. Um, I have my home folder. Then I have a folder called projects where I keep all my programming projects. And then I have a folder called uni, which has my old university projects. And then I'm cloning here, right? So I'm cloning it in that place. And then, you know, I can easily find where it is and I can kind of work with it. Um, there is one a little bit more advanced caveat uh, because um, what we will do is uh, if in this, uh, so if I open this in some sort of a file explorer, uh, you will see that I have my uh, proc 205 folder and then I have a project which is inside that folder, right? And this is a Git top level Git repo. Uh, those ones will be different projects for uh, different examples that we do. So in, in here, like if I, if I go uh, here, you will see that um, this is like the top level. Uh, and then we will have folders for modules and example code because we want everything to be in a single place. That is not, uh, I, I, you know, people can use it this way and it will work, but it's not kind of the orthodox way of using Go modules. Uh, if you go to, um, to any GitHub uh, repository which has Go, Golang code, you will realize that uh, the module is kind of on the top level of a GitHub uh, repository. And then the subfolders are packages and it kind of represents a single module with multiple packages. Uh, so normally, if you were to design your application, what would you do is you would have Hello World as a top level uh, repository in your Git, and then everything else will follow under this. Uh, and then if you need another project, another module, you will have another repository with the top level name of that repository, right? Uh, so the way we doing it in the class, the way we doing it here for the, um, for the course, we will have folders per uh, module, but that's not the orthodox way of doing Golang projects. The orthodox way of doing Golang projects is to have a single module in a top level repo. And then if you need another one, you have to have another repo. You know, out of the simplicity, because those projects are very simple and those projects are only for demonstration purposes, we don't want to have like 20 different Git repos to show you like hello world stuff that therefore we keep everything in a single Git repo. Uh, but if you have a normal uh, Golang project, you should keep it into the, you know, in its own uh, repository. Um, okay, I went over time, so let's uh, have um, let's have ten minutes break, uh, and then we we reconvene and we continue. And I will answer about the, there was a question from Ole uh, about upper and lower case names for for functions, and I will explain how how it works. So uh, ten minutes break, so we will uh, reconvene when the timer runs out. So let's have um, 10 minutes, I guess. Great.
Great. Yes, 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 I know. Where is the tab? Here. Great. Okay, so I pushed the whatever we wrote so far. Uh, so I pushed this uh, dummy uh, code uh, onto the repo. So you can, uh, when you clone it, you will have the, the sort of the hello world skeleton already here. Uh, so as I said, like we will keep kind of folders uh, explaining some of the things. And what you do is you, you clone the whole repo, go into that folder, and then you can usually just go uh, go run. Uh, and that will, uh, sorry, uh, go build. Uh, and that will um, build the executable for you. And then you can test it. Or you can probably say go run, and it will also uh, run that particular one because it's an executable. Um, and in the IDE, uh, you can do the same, right? So you can um, open it in Visual Studio Code or your, your own IDE and sort of uh, use it. Um, yeah, so Marius is unknown spelling. Yeah, so Visual Studio uh, Code also has the terminal tab. And I sometimes do that, right? So I'm already in the hello world, like it puts you into the, the, the place where you have your where you have your code. So I am kind of in the in the right place, like a users, Marius, projects, uni, prog, blah, blah, blah. So I clone the repo at that point. Uh, and then I'm inside the hello world uh, module. So because I'm already inside the hello world module, I can do the same things as I was doing in the terminal here. Uh, and you can build and you can run uh, your program uh, this way as well. So then you run it by saying hello world, right? So I encourage you to, to try it out, to, to test it, that you have your sort of a basic setup uh, ready. And then there was a question uh, whether the functions should have a small or capital letter. And as you've noticed, uh, the P has a capital letter, but my M and A are small letters, right? What would be the difference if they were made capital or small? Uh, so if I re, re, you know, change it to the capital, uh, you in, in a lot of programming languages, that's just a, a convention. You can do either way, right? In Golang, that's not only the convention, it's a, actually a mechanism for exporting some functionality out of your package. Uh, I will talk a little bit about it. I will talk more about it later. Uh, but the idea is that you have this encapsulation of functions inside your packages and the functions which are written with the small first letter, they are only visible inside the package. Uh, and the functions which are written with the capital letter are public and they are visible outside the package. So you see in the package FNT, you may have, uh, as we were observing, where is my... Um, yeah, so package, uh, in, in, okay, in this particular case, we have the package H, uh, net slash HTTP. And if you observe all the functions, which are public, have capital first letter, right? But it doesn't mean internally, the package net slash HTTP doesn't have any private functions. And the private functions, which are not visible outside the package, are small first letter. And they are used by all those functions, potentially. Uh, so if you want something to be exposed to the outside world, you have to name it with the capital first letter. And if you want that particular function to be hidden, to be private, uh, you keep it uh, as small. So the, a good rule of thumb is you start when you code, you start doing everything with small letters. And then the compiler will complain to you if you really need to have some visibility outside of your package. And then it will tell you, oh, yeah, I don't know what you mean. Like, uh, I don't see it. And then you will have to change it to the capital letter. And then uh, you, you basically have like a, uh, the minimum uh, exposure uh, to make everything private unless it needs to be public, right? So as you see, the entire net slash HTTP package has only like a handful of public me uh, methods, right? P public functions. Uh, everything else is hidden, it's not visible. Uh, the complexity of the package is probably much higher, but you don't need to see it. You only using those public, uh, public interface, the public functions here. Um, so that's 
how it works. We will come back to that uh, a little bit later. So coming back to our uh, mentee, uh, what is important in programming? Yes, we have a lot of ideas here. Um, thinking is important, uh, but the, the question has um, uh, kind of a hidden agenda. <laughs> so one, one uh, of course, brain and um, uh, clean code, working code, those are important. Uh, problem solving is important. All of those are important. Um, so we have a couple of ones. Yeah, it's kind of tricky to let me see if I can stop. No, I cannot. So um, there was one which had um, um, uh, yeah. So simplicity. So uh, and then there is uh, yeah, and not unreadable code. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, easy to understand code. Uh, that's good. So simplicity, ease of use. Um, all right. Let, let's let's have a look. So I have pointed out some uh, some aspects which which are kind of important. So there there are kind of a three main aspects, right? So the the one which was like simplicity, ease of understanding, and so on. They kind of relate to maintenance, right? They relate to how easy it is to uh, fix the problem, build the problem, and and, and so on. That there is one which is also important, which is productivity. So how fast can you deliver the working solution, right? So productivity and maintenance they kind of often go together, but sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit of your productivity for maintenance. So for example, if you want to have a better maintained code, uh, you have to spend a little bit more time decomposing your functions and making them mockable such that you can write the tests uh, and you know make the, uh, the maintenance easier. So productivity and maintenance, they often go together, but sometimes they fight, right? So to increase maintenance, you have to like lower, a little bit lower your productivity. Performance is a third one and often you know, to have something really fast, you have to be slow to get there and you have to be a bit ugly to, to squeeze that performance out, right? So often to achieve the best performance, you have to sacrifice maintenance and productivity, right? Um, so those are kind of the options that you have and you have to balance like how, what, what is the most important for you? Uh, is the most important to have the fast code out? And if it's true, then usually JavaScript or Python are the, the choice, right? Because you're really productive. You can have a solution done really fast in terms of uh, time you spend coding, right? Uh, if you want something big and complex and you want to maintain it, uh, Python might not be the best one because it's a little bit tricky to maintain large complex Python problem, uh, programs. Uh, and also performance is not usually the strong you know, asset of uh, languages like JavaScript or, or Python. So, you know, you, you have those three and you need to balance it. And when you're designing a programming language, again, you need to balance it. So the, the thing is the Golang strikes a very good balance across all three, right? So compared to a lot of other programming languages, it's not worse, if not better, and while uh, in a particular axis, while maintaining the, the other ones, right? So for example, in terms of productivity, it actually is challenging Python. It's, it's as easy to code as it is in Python while you have much stronger maintenance and performance characteristics. Uh, in terms of performance, it often beats uh, not well-designed C++ code actually. Uh, in the other course, we, we will compare some of the programs written in uh, C++ and, and Golang. And Golang often comes at the top, uh, same, uh, same with Rust. Uh, but the time to produce the solution in Golang is much faster than to, to code it in C++ or, or, or Rust. So again, those three, uh, the, the language designers, they paid attention and they really did it, did it well. Um, okay, so we have... Um, some tooling uh, in the in the tool chain. Uh, so we have a couple of commands that are very um, um, 
supporting you in your day-to-day -day coding tasks. Uh, so formatting, as you've noticed, um, let's go back to my editor. Where is the here? Okay. So if I go here and if I say, uh, for example, if I do this, Uh, okay, and now I press save. Uh, uh, this doesn't work, uh, but so first of all, it doesn't work first of uh, because I have a compiler error. Um, the placement of the brackets in Golang is enforced by the compiler, and this style of C++ bracket placement is illegal. Uh, it's not a matter of style, it's a matter of a compile uh, error. So you have to fix that yourself. But then when I press, I press save, you see the, the code got formatted for me. And that has happened because uh, of the built-in tool chain, which mm, does the code formatting for you. Um, so even if you type the code a little bit untidy, even if you have you know, uh, spaces and, and kind of untidy placement of, of how you wrote your code, the moment you, you press save, the code gets kind of standardized and uh, formatted to the desired uh, characteristics. Um, well, you may say, yeah, I, I kind of hate it. I want the code the way I want to see it. But, you know, it turns out that um, if you're working in teams and you have a certain standard way of formatting things, it's easier to read and it's easier to maintain uh, because everybody follows the same rules. If you have like, you know, 20 developers and everybody has their own style of placing brackets and, and uh, formatting the code, uh, your productivity as a team will go down because you will have to adjust to the particular characteristics of a particular coder, right? Uh, so um, Golang fixes that by, you know, having a certain mechanism which are kind of built in. Uh, and you either have it part of your IDE, uh, or even if you don't use IDE, even if you just use command line, you can just go, uh, go format and it will basically format all the source code that is in the current folder. I, I use the dot, which means from now on format everything. And then um, it sort of says uh, print um, um, print the errors, but also change the code uh, because you can you can run the Go formatting uh, to tell you what's wrong, but not fix it, and you you can have it kind of fixed. Um, all right, so. And then we have things like uh, go fix. Uh, for this hello world, there is not much to go wrong, so we cannot really fix much. But for more, your more complex problems, uh, you can run uh, go fix, and it will tell you how you can improve your code. How can you improve the uh, the structure or readability of your code? Um, then we have linters. There is a kind of a built-in linter uh, into the standard uh, tool, and there is a kind of a meta linter which includes a lot of third-party uh, linting support. Uh, what is linting? Uh, linting means um, formatting the code to a kind of a desirable uh, standard. Uh, and in Golang, part of that standard is kind of here already. It's part of the code formatting, but it's still, um, for example, in relation to naming variables or to uh, structuring your comments and, and so on. Th there are additional uh, elements which the, the linters will kind of help you to maintain and standardize. Uh, one of the uh, interesting um, uh, tool chain elements, which is Go testing, is that it has built in kind of a documentation and testing um, uh, facility. So I, I can uh, document this function. And usually you document uh, this function by repeating the name of the function as a first word and then describing what this function does. So add adds to numbers, right? Um, because this is a, a private function, it's not a big deal whether you document it or not. But if I make it, uh, if I make it um, a public uh, function, then um, this this keyword in some IDs gets highlighted because then it, it is uh, important and it adds up in the documentation, right? So the documentation and testing um, sort of, I will not spend too much time, but they are building into the language. So we will spend a little bit more time later, like maybe next week on testing uh, and how you document your, your functions. You will see it from the examples 
uh, which will be in the Git repo as well. Okay. Um, so IDE, yes, uh, Christopher covered that uh, last time. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Uh, we don't uh, enforce any particular one. Uh, my approach to this is, you know, you are here to learn, you are here to experiment. Uh, so try them all, like try whatever you want. Uh, if you don't like it, you can try something else. Um, your code will not disappear, uh, whether you use it with this ID or with the other ID, uh, it will be always the same. Uh, so just, you know, familiarize yourself. Um, for very small things, I like Vim because it's very fast. So I can quickly uh, open a file. So I can, you know, quickly open the uh, main file and kind of uh, navigate myself uh, and, and do something here. I don't need to wait for the ID to fire up and, and uh, to do it. Like even Vim has certain support. So as you see, it highlights me that I have a mismatch between this ad and this ad that this symbol is unknown. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, um, instrument your, your Golang uh, Vim support in Vim. Uh, I use code, uh, but the preferred one for bigger projects is, is IntelliJ. Um, it has an excellent language support. And um, because I'm, I program in multiple languages, I like the ultimate uh, and um, the Go plugin. Um, always install the necessary plugin, which will make your life a little bit easier. It will kind of introduce the syntax highlighting and all the kind of a linting and uh, formatting facilities for you. So it will be kind of nice to use. Um, you can tell us uh, which one you use and why you love it. Uh, and we can add it to the list for students. Uh, you can tell us in the wiki as well. Uh, but from experience, IntelliJ is is pretty good. And as NTNU students, you have access to the ultimate uh, release. Uh, so yeah, give it a try. All right, so how to learn a new programming language? You all will have to learn a new programming language in this course, uh, in the cloud course. And then you will have to learn two programming languages in the other course, uh, or get exposure to other, other programming languages. So how, how you do that? Well, you have to write code. Yeah, that I cannot agree more, right? So you have to make things, write code, um, and you need to do it yourself. Like you watching me coding this hello world is not as productive as you typing it yourself. You may feel, yeah, I know, like I, I know how to do it, but if you don't do it yourself, you will not really know. Uh, you have to do it yourself. So like you watching other people code is good. I mean, you learn some, some uh, good practices or some tricks. But you have to try, yeah, learn by trying, um, practice, do assignments. Um, yeah, try to understand what you already know and what you need to learn more. Um, great, those are all good um, right in it. Those are all very good uh, suggestions. So I strongly recommend you after this class, you navigate yourself to a URL, which is store golang.org. Um, so if you check this URL, so let me show it again. So it's tour.golang.org. Easy to remember. Um, and then if you go there, uh, you will see kind of a, a friendly gopher. <laughs> And you will see that, yeah, we have kind of an interactive um, tutorial, uh, which guides you through all the language features. Uh, and you, by clicking through that tutorial, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you say next, and then it will kind of tell you about the packages. So that's what I told you about the main package. It will kind of navigate you through like what the packages are, how you refer to them and like how you use them and so on. So this is, a very simple, very step-by-step -step tutorial that will kind of guide you through the core features of the language. Uh, and I strongly recommend you click through it. Uh, most of that, if you are familiar with programming, will be very easy. Uh, but even, for example, like that we use in curly braces to group things uh, is kind of important, right? Uh, and you will see that you know a more orthodox way of doing things, doing imports is this, right? You, there is no error. Uh, so let me go back to my code. 
uh, there is no error saying uh, import math, right? I can do this, uh, but uh, first of all, I'm not using math. So that's already a, a compiler error saying, why are you importing it if you're not using it? And second, it's not really the way, you know, uh, Golang does it because they suggest you do that instead, right? Both are legal, uh, but one, oops, one is a little bit more, uh, you know, um, yeah, so it's the same with constants, right? So I can have a constant, constant, uh, like name, which is Marius, and another name, const, oops, another constant age, which is one, two, three. Uh, this works, but again, this is not kind of as nice as saying, okay, I have some constants and I will have them like this. Right. So by by clicking through the tutorial, it will sort of uh, show you some more orthodox or some uh, kind of a uh, cleaner way of doing certain things. So do that. Do do that tour. Um, how long it will take you if you know the basics? It probably will take you like less than an hour to go through the whole language, and you will you will sort of feel it. Uh, we will go through some of the aspects of it. Uh, which I think are a little bit more tricky, uh, but uh, most of that it's easy. Um, so yes, uh, pick a small project, uh, do um, watch YouTube videos from people that love that particular language. Don't watch the generic YouTube videos. Uh, there are some people who have a channel dedicated to Golang. Uh, then th those usually are quite good. I will leave some links in the in the course wiki. Uh, and definitely read the uh, the documentation, right? Read the docs. Uh, most of the explanations and most of the examples are super friendly, uh, and they uh, they will get you started really fast and really well. Uh, so I recommend that strongly. Okay, so then um, let me see. We've already done that. So we wrote a simple hello world to the screen. Um, you should try to do that yourself uh, after the class. Um, now we have another task. We wrote the hello world. Um, uh, let me maybe open the, I don't know how, how what's the best way of showing you the, the structure. So uh, we have, Okay, so we have the hello world module and inside the hello world module, we have a single package. The single package is called main and we have everything in here, right? Everything in a, in a flat, uh, flat place. So if I make another folder called util, uh, then I have some code which is like on the top level and I want to organize my code better to have some utilities inside the util folder and that will be my new package because I want some functions to be visible to others and some functions not to be visible to others. So what I will do is I will put some code here and then use it from my main, which I will ma uh, maintain in the top level, right? So let's, uh, let's do that. So if I go back here, I remove the executable such that it doesn't uh, messes with us. Uh, we have the main, which is the top in the top level, and then I have utils. For convenience sake, I will copy the main.go to the util, and I will rename it to util.go, right? So now if I come here, you see I have main, which is my, my normal main, and I have a util, which has a util.go. So before I, I edit this file, I will come back here and I will say, okay, let's take this add function and delete it from here. Uh, so I will copy that and yank it. Um, and then I will move it to the package called util. And in util, I have to change the name because, okay, let's delete everything actually. I already have the, yeah, so I don't need to copy this one because I already have it here. Right, so now before the package was called main because it contained an executable, right? Now my package should be called something else. And because we have 
a convention of matching the package to the folder name, I will call my package util, right? So now inside util, I have a util.go. This name doesn't mean anything. This name can be anything. In, in fact, let's, uh, let's uh, rename it so that it's not confuse, confusing. Um, uh, all right, I rename it here. So cd util move uh, util.go to tools.go such that we don't have the confusion, right? So now um, I have tools. Uh, and then in tools, I have a single method called add. Uh, the runtime system uh, or, or the tool, tool chain complains that why are you not using it, uh, which is correct. But if I go to my main and I say, yes, I want to use it, then I need to import it, right? So because I want to import it, I need to say, I'm gonna use my, uh, is it called util? Yes, it's called util. Um, yeah, something is not quite right. I lost uh, package util. What do you complain? It's redeclared. Yeah, right. Okay, let's close the whole thing. Let's try to build it. Go build. So I have undefined and in main. So let's run, let's reopen my IDE. And let's see what it says. Okay, it will re-index the symbols. And now if I say util, that one is correct. This one is, oh, come on, work. see no oh, yeah yeah okay so my mistake so that this is almost correct but because um what we do is we import with a single uh, uh quotes all the standard packages so golang thinks util is a, a standard package which it isn't i have to tell it well, actually util is part, it's, it's a package inside my hello world module, right? So I actually have to say hello uh, world uh, module. Uh, and then, because you know we have the top level is hello world, that's my whole module. And then hello world has packages. The top level is called main and it contains the main function. And util is the, the package which is um, with the tools, with the utilities. So to import it, I have to say, hello world util. So now if I save it, oh, come on. You such a stubborn, um, let me close this. I hate, uh, don't save. So vim, main.go. Okay, uh, let's see. So hello world uh, util. I have to double check um, if I named go module what we named. Yes, we have named the module hello world like this. So the main. Uh, Hello world. Oops. Why doesn't see it? Yeah, that's a bit tricky. Um, let me see. So let's try something else. I seem to have 
some problems with the uh, it is called util that's correct that's correct um, yeah let me try one more thing so I will try IntelliJ. Yeah, you sometimes get into trouble. Um, so Ola is asking, can I use the relative path and say uh, dot util? Uh, yes, you can say that, but it will. Um, it is not a nice way of doing it. So the the relative uh, packages. Usually what we do is we try to do them um, um, through referencing the kind of a top level uh, module instead. So it would, it would work, uh, but I don't want to do that this way. So let me try um, projects, uni, uh, proc, proc, hello world. Open right, so we will see kind of a we will see a yet another IDE, um, and maybe it will help me to see. Yeah, trouble happens when you live coding, of course, um, and unfortunately, you don't see where I'm doing a mistake, so you cannot help me. Uh, but maybe this will help. So usually uh, I, uh, IntelliJ is quite good at picking up what you're doing wrong and usually it tells you uh, good suggestions. So we will see in a moment. So with the IntelliJ, it's very important that you click this button setup go root uh, and you pick your, um, your proper um, Golang uh, installation for your project. Um, I don't want to be committing to the repo. It will index uh, all the um, it will index all the symbols, and then if I go to util, I will see. Yeah, you see, it kind of highlights the at because at is a kind of the public name. So this one at least works as expected. Um, and with this one, let's see. Hello world. Good deal. No, this one hates me for it as well. Yeah, I'm doing something wrong, something really obvious. Uh, but I cannot see what that is. Let me try uh, force it. Okay, I want this. I see, I see, I see. So, okay, so now I know what I was doing wrong. Okay, so at so we are in this situation, and I'm trying to import uh, a package to have this symbol resolved, right? And I'm doing a correct thing. I am doing it. I was always doing a correct thing. So hello world is a correct thing to do to import that uh, that package, right? But I'm using that symbol wrongly. So when I'm pressing save, uh, it says, well, you know, this package is not being used, so I'm gonna delete it. And all the IDs were doing that, right? So when I'm pressing save, it says, oh, you know, you're not using that import. Therefore, I'm deleting it, but I'm trying to use it for this symbol. But to properly use that symbol, I have to say util do that. <laughs> Sorry for that. So hello world. So it was fine uh, world. Yeah, and it even suggested I need to do that. So that's the proper way of doing it, right? So now I am importing util. And from util, I am calling at function, but I have to prefix it with the last path of the, of the, like if you have a long chain, like your packages can be nested. So I can have net like HTTP and, and so on. And then in Golang, you always using the last path element as a prefix for calling the functions of that path, right? Uh, so if you, in our case, it's util. And in our case, whoops, um, 
In our case, the last path element is util. So to call add, I have to have util.add. Because I have it like this, then this is unknown symbol. This is an unused package. Therefore, yeah, the ID was like messing up with me, right? Um, and I didn't, uh, I didn't notice that mistake, right? All right, so now what happened is we have a package, a single package called uh, util, which has uh, some functionality exposed. And as I was explaining, if the functions are written, like if I have another like a uh, helper function, which does something, the helper is not visible, right? So if you try to do, um, if you try to call uh, util, util.helper, it will complain uh, that, um, you know, it, it, you cannot call helper because it's an unexported function, right? So if you want to call helper, it suggests, well, you have to export function, right? So if you click it, what it did, it changed the helper to capital H and it called it with capital H, right? Uh, so now it's exported and I can call it from outside. Um, why it's called from outside? Well, we live in the main package and this one is in the util package. So we are we have this kind of a package uh, level uh, uh, um, visibility, right? So now to sum it up, uh, I don't need the, the helper. Uh, and then in the main, I am not calling the helper. If I save it, uh, everything works fine and we see uh, we decomposed our original hello world into now uh, kind of a package le level visibility with some core uh, level uh, functionality for the main. And the beauty of this setup is you can have multiple subfolders here. You can decompose and organize your code the way you want and then have kind of a main entry point at the top level. And then this, this um, file will be using all your kind of utilities or whatever logic you need to have organized nicely here. And as I said, it can be nested. So I can say slash something else if I want to nest the, the packages, you just create subfolders, right? Um, and then same as in Java, it will kind of use the naming conventions of the folders, right? So the this is the pack, the module name. That's what we have in Go mod. This, this is the, that name. Uh, and then uh, this is just following the, the path of your of your packages. So we solved this one. So we have hello world two, which is write a function in utils somewhere else, and then uh, call it from main go, right? Um, yeah, actually that's the second one because this task was to keep it in the same level, uh, but the next one was to keep it in the, um, in their own package. So we, we basically managed to do that. Okay, so I spent a little bit of time finding a bug. <laughs> So um, uh, sorry for that. Uh, and uh, we don't have uh, much um, left to finish. Um, I will talk about object-oriented patterns in Golang uh, on Wednesday. So I will start the, the Wednesday session to tell you a little bit more about how you do object-oriented programming in, in Golang without objects, classes, and inheritance. Like, whoa, how can we do that then? Uh, and uh, we continue uh, on Wednesday. If you have any questions, um, uh, I am available on Discord. So as, as you know, uh, we have this uh, big Discord server uh, and there are two, two discussion fora for the two courses. Uh, if you have questions related to cloud, ask them here. But if you have questions related to programming, uh, please ask you know ask them here and you will get um, you will get my attention. <laughs> uh, you will get my attention in both, but programming it's kind of a more desirable to be discussed here. Um, if you have some cloud related questions, of course, uh, it doesn't matter that much. Okay, so um, that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much and I will see you guys. Uh, I will see. Uh, the BPROC people uh, earlier on Monday, and then I will see everybody else on uh, three o'clock on Monday, uh, 3.15. We will have a lecture on uh, for the BPROC people on Monday because I haven't finished uh, going over the logistics. So I uh, please uh, go for both, come for both, come for uh, PROC 206 
and for PROC 205. So we will have class at 12 and at 3, the, the BPROC students on Monday. Uh, there will be no extra session for BPROC students in the morning on, on Wednesday. So that stays only for the, um, yeah, so just kind of a quick reminder that only uh, refers to the BPROC students. So on Monday, we will have a normal class. On Wednesday, we will have no class, only the uh, Golang on uh, 10 o'clock. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mariusz. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks.